of his practice, David Beard here from uh, Oxford. Uh, David is the co-director of the Royal College Surgeon and Surgical Trials Unit at Oxford and um, is, really supports us in our STN. We're almost based out of Oxford, um, so they're our first port of call for help. And we're very lucky today he's going to give us some uh, top tips, is that right? Ten, <coughs> ten issues. Ten issues. Okay. Thank you very much, Abby. Um, the word there, Stolperstein, those of you who speak German um, will probably know it's a stumbling block. So I was given that talk, the talk in Heidelberg quite recently, and got a long day listening to a whole day of German talks. But I thought that the word was quite good. It's a, a stumbling blocks and, and issues with surgical trials. And what I'm going to do is just go very quickly through aspects of surgical trials as opposed to pharmacological trials for you and pull out some details which you might want to think about. Um, this is the list of them. Uh, checking assumptions, some issues around surgical attitude, which I'm just going to briefly talk on, it's a bit of nettle. Um, best comparisons, and as Abby said, there's issues on placebo and what we should be comparing against. Uh, preference and equipoise to the surgeon. Skill and standardization and expertise, which is really key to all these studies. Patient preference, which crops in. Um, Expertise-based design, which takes account of some of these things. And then the old waiting list problems and timings of assessments. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And lastly, we're just going to mention about changing clinical practice and how we do that. Um, and the reason why I brought these in is we want to move away from the old days. And drugs, they did it years ago with the FDA in the States and, and putting some evidence around some of the practice that we have. There's some solutions to some of these problems. Um, but unfortunately some remain as problems and, and we'll work through them. Right, to start with, um, the first thing that we must do uh, for all these trials, and I think it's been highlighted today as well, uh, repeatedly, is that we have to remove some of the folklore associated with some of the clinical practices that we have when we start thinking about doing a trial. And it's all about confirming that the uncertainty exists or that the premises for the trial really do exist. And you may do that in various ways. You might do it in a feasibility study or a pilot. You may do it in surveys. You may do it with PPI, which is uh, patient and public involvement. But you have to really put some numbers and some hard information around the back of some of the assumptions that you've got. So what we've got, you know, you've got examples up there from your area. Are there enough nail bed repairs to perform to warrant the trial? Do surgeons in, in, insert different knee replacements? I'm going to give you an example of that in a second. Is the assumed pathway that you're working with correct? And we're very good at just thinking, assuming that that's all in place, but you have to have the evidence right from the start that it does. And there's just a couple of slides on each of these topics. And I'll give you an example. It tends to be out of orthopedics, because that's my background, uh, musculoskeletal. Um, so there are lots of orthopedic examples, but they do, they do uh, exemplify <coughs> quite well. Now, for us, in this trial called TopCat, which was total versus partial knee replacement, comparing a total knee replacement versus... Uh, a partial one for the same pathology. We thought, look, there's two operations, surgeons are going to do one or the other. But we really didn't have the hard evidence to say that that was the case. What we did in that case was give 150 clinical cases, including x-rays, uh, to four different surgeons of four different grades, which we were quite interested to see how they would do between them there, uh, and asked them what operation they would do with those particular cases. And you can see there that the distribution was exceptionally different. The, the, the surgeons that were from a specific centre, a design centre for the unicompartmental knee, obviously did a lot more unicompartmental knee replacements. The others tended to do more totals, but they had 50-50. There was a difference in treatment choice of up to nearly 60%. So we were able to establish our uncertainty. And I would suggest that when we're starting off, if you haven't got that kind of data, you need to go back and fill it in. And it's a strong point. The funding bodies will look for that. Okay, number two. Um, this one's the nettle, and it's a bit uncomfortable speaking to you about it, because, but it's not you guys here, because you're here on a Saturday. But there is an assumption with surgery a lot of the time that, of course, it works. There's statements that come out like this, I wouldn't have done this if I don't have uh, an effective treatment and it doesn't have any value. There's also issues about livelihood in there. And there are important issues, and they can't be brushed under the carpet, because they're really key and critical to see whether we will carry on and look at surgery and intervene. Uh, in this way. It has escaped it so far, interestingly, compared with some of the pharmacological world, but it's going to probably come back. Now the reason why there's tension there is because um, this on the, on the left hand side here, this is the world of clinical trials. It's a whole big deep pool of uncertainty 
and that's not a comfortable area for you guys as surgeons to be in. You're certainly not in this area here. This is not the world of surgeons. Surgeons are decision makers, they're clear thinkers, they want decisions very quickly. It's not about uncertainty. And that's what you've been trained to do. And all of a sudden you're being asked to start questioning things and putting things in place which is unfamiliar to you. That is quite a barrier um, for this sort of process. Now, still on that subject, do, do we have to do it really? Because surely that what you're doing is, is effective. But if you look at a, a recent placebo study that we've done, we, we reviewed all the placebo study uh, controlled trials in surgery, and there was only 53 in total to start with. And only one of those had a no treatment group. So only one surgical trial could tell you that the surgery works over nothing at all. So there's clearly a need to evaluate this, and we must probably embrace it. Those of you who are fearful of it, um, I would encourage you not to be, because ultimately it's going to support you. And there's going to be lots of practices out there which are exceptionally valuable and you'll be able to continue doing. But if you don't do it as a community yourselves, other people will start undermining and starting looking. So we might as well do it from our own side. Okay, comparisons. What should we compare against? When you start to do trials, you've heard an awful lot about different groups and things, and there's a, there's a level of complexity about comparisons. First of all, you have to decide whether you just want to look at a benefit hierarchy, whether one thing is better or the other, or whether you want to look at a fundamental truth, whether it works or not. The first ones are relatively easy to do. They're easiest to recruit to and they're sensible things. The patient needs the, the treatment or the intervention anyway. And so when you're recruiting, you're offering them a choice of two things really, and patients are quite comfortable with that. It doesn't matter whether it's a device, like we just said in the Top Cat study, or whether it's a procedure. If we're going to do it, you're going to probably get to the same place ultimately. We just want to see which is the best. They're relatively easy things to do. The bigger questions, and the tricky ones, are the ones when you start to say, is surgery beneficial? And that's when you have to start introducing, which is not a place to start, as I've been said, no treatment groups, and possibly placebo, which we'll talk about in a second. And that's with devices, you either put the device in or you don't, or you do a particular procedure, or you don't. And that's often unacceptable to patients, and sometimes it can be unacceptable to ethics committees as well. So it's a slightly more complicated world. If you're going to start off, I recommend you start off on the top layer there. So that brings us into the world of placebos. Um, and you might think, placebo for, um, for, for surgery? Surely not, we can't do that. Um, well, we can. So the first question is, is surgery beneficial? To do that, we have to have a no-treatment group. It's ethically a bit, a bit dodgy, but we also might ask whether it's the, really the right question that we want to ask. It disregards, we know, that surgery has substantial placebo effects. We know that. And if you ask surgery, we've done a survey, uh, and ask people like yourselves, um, do you use operations that you believe have a, a significant placebo component? And 77% have suggested that they think that there's some therapeutic benefit of placebo. So it is there. There's other things that came out of that as well, which is quite interesting. Surgeons are concerned about deception and the, and the patient trust relationship. But the, the basic fact is that surgery has a sizable component of placebo and we can't afford to ignore it. So the question then becomes, does surgery offer greater benefit above that of placebo? And that's an altogether different question. And what we can do there is we can control for this effect of placebo. We can take account of it, put in that factor which is making some of those benefits below the, what we call the critical surgical element that you'll see in a bit. So we have some quantification of the placebo effect as well, and we have an understanding of the mechanism. So it's really valuable. Let's just talk a little bit more. This is the only area I've got three or four slides, because I think it's quite interesting and it's going to be an area for the future. You have to have a definition of what placebo is for surgery. There's a very pure and simple version of it, which you might be familiar, and that's just sham surgery, where you pretend to do the surgery. There's no cutting, there's no physiological insult, little or no known surgical value, so you might just nip the skin or something like that. And that is like trials, you may have seen the Mosley trial in the knee, um, where they had a completely sham surgery. Those ones are quite straightforward. The ones that are more difficult are placebo interventions, and these are defined slightly different. A placebo intervention is where what you think is the critical surgical element is removed from it. So the surgery is exactly the same as what you would do normally, but you take out the critical surgical element. And that's hard to define as well. So there's a whole area of work in establishing what you think is the critical surgical element. It could be a very broad thing. It could be a very specific thing. But it gives us really important information when we get those trials set up about the mechanism for effect. 
and it's also ethically more acceptable because you can use placebo studies that are normally based on surgeries which have some clinical value. And we've got one of these running at the moment, and again, I would certainly suggest that you don't go ahead, it's very complicated at the moment, but it's worth knowing about because this perhaps will be the future. We've got a shoulder arthroscopy trial, which is a uh, subacromial decompression uh, done with an arthroscope, and we have a comparative group, which is the, the optimal treatment that we think it is at the moment, if you like. We take away a piece of bone um, from the acromion as the active surgical treatment. And then we compare it with just arthroscopy only, which is not a, not a sham surgery, but it is a placebo intervention. It is the surgery exactly the same, but with the critical surgical element removed from it. And that's one comparison, the active treatment versus the placebo. And that will tell us whether you need to take the bone off or not. It will give us an understanding of the mechanism. The second comparison is if you put in a no treatment control. And when you do that, we have actually got information about the efficacy of treatment. We'll know whether surgery, you could probably club them together, but we're probably unlikely to because it contaminates things a bit. We'll probably just compare the subacromial decompression, the optimal, against, we've called it active monitoring and specialist reassessment because um, patients don't like to have a no treatment label attached to it. But that will give us an idea about whether surgery works or not. And the second comparison will give us an indication of whether you need to take the bone off or not. Okay. Number four, we can come back to that and I'm happy to ask any, answer any questions on placebo. Now what about surgeon preference and equipoise? This word is bandied around an awful lot. Um, again, we've said that there's preference and, and people prefer one particular. It's very rare that you get a sur surgeon who says, I don't really mind which one I do, I'll do both of them. They normally have uh, a preferred operation that they do. And, and you saw that with the TKR, UKR top cat example earlier. But it, if you sort of peel it back, you wonder where it comes from. Sometimes it's, it's very anecdotal. It's where people were trained and how they were trained. It perhaps is a personal portfolio. It's looking at their own results. Perhaps sometimes they look at the literature, but not always. It may even be a trust policy. But it makes it quite difficult when people do have an opinion. What you don't have is this ever happens. Surgeons always have, as we already said, an opinion on what to do. Now, that makes it very difficult, again, for doing a trial where you have to throw this world of uncertainty in and say, I don't mind which arm you go in to a patient. Sits in front of you and you say, I would have done this treatment, I was going to operate, but you know what, I'll step back and say, I don't know whether I should be or not. And you have to be in that position, and it's called equipoise, to be able to recruit the patient into the trial. <coughs> so this is the schema that works. We either have um, a belief that the treatment benefit is completely equal. It's very rare, but then you're in full equipoise. And then you can randomise, you'd be quite happy to. You can say honestly to the patient, I don't know which would be best, so I'm really happy for you to be in there. It's pretty rare, but it does happen. The second level down from that is where, and it's quite common actually in surgery, is that there is a, there's a, there's a treatment benefit that's perceived as unequal, but it tends to be a personal preference, and once you unpick it, you can't really find out why it is, and it's not really evidence-based. And we call that in part equipoise, it's clinical equipoise, but because of the overall lack of evidence and because there's still this personal preference going on and it's in part equipoise, you can still randomise by treatment. So you can say, I'm happy for the patient to go in this study. The last one is, of course, when there's unequal benefit assumed, firm personal preference, you're completely out of equipoise and you cannot randomise the patients. You cannot go any further with that. And then you need to start thinking about different designs and I'm going to talk to you a bit about expertise-based designs. What they do is they take the best surgery for A against the best surgery for B, so people can still put their hand up and say, I'm sticking to my what I believe in, and you're sticking to what you believe in, and we'll put those two together as a group, and you'll see in a second. But they are rare, rare as hen's teeth. But they've been around for a little while, and um, if you see them there, 1980, I think, the first one was reported. Okay.